Have you ever wondered, like I've wondered, why God put in the Garden of Eden, right in the middle, a tree with really beautiful fruit and then told Adam and Eve they couldn't eat from it? I mean, have you ever wondered that? Because I have, and, and I think there are probably... There are probably many answers, many of which we, we don't know why God did that. I think some we could, uh, from the Bible, probably come up with a pretty good answer of, of why God chose to provide everything that Adam and Eve could possibly need, but right in the middle of that put something that they, they could not eat from. And, and the Bible said it was beautiful. You should wonder about that because there's an, I think one of the big answers to that is almost never talked about. And we're going to talk about it today because it has a lot to do with your life and your Christian maturity and the, the kingdom of heaven here on earth, which is now, here and now. It has a lot to do with that, and we need to understand that. So we're going we're gonna to talk about that today. So um, before we go to God's word, let's just, let's just pray together. Lord... As we open your word this morning, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to illuminate it to us, that we glean truth from your word, because your word is truth. And Jesus, you said that the truth of your word sanctifies us. It makes us holy. And so we pray that today for all of us here, all of us watching, in the name of Jesus, amen. All right, so if you have a Bible or a phone app or whatever, you want to open up to Genesis chapter 2. It's an easy book to find, right? Just open your Bible close to the, to the beginning, and there it is. And it just read a, a pretty familiar passage, I think, to most of you. Just uh, three verses here. Genesis 2, starting in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Again, there's, there's a, a hundred sermons you could preach from that, right? And there's a, a lot of reasons why we could surmise why God said, Don't eat from that, right? Well, we're going to talk about one today. Um... When he said, don't eat from this tree, he was not making a suggestion. He was making a rule, right? And he's like, here's a rule. I have one rule, don't eat from that tree. As far as we know, that's the only rule he made, like right up to that point, right? Just don't eat from the tree. And why should they? Because they had everything else they needed. Um... So here's, so why, what is, why I think a really, really important reason that we're going to talk about today, why God did that. Um, Here it is, point number one. God is our ruler, not just our provider. In other words, in the Garden of Eden, the very first thing God did for mankind is to provide for them, right? He didn't even provide just for their needs. He provided a lot of their wants, I mean, it was a perfect place. They had no need. And he provided all that. And so from the very beginning of creation, he's showing that he's a provider. And he is that. I also know this, and I've, I've learned this over time. I've seen it in my own life. And you look through the lens of history, you see this repeating over and over. But I've heard it put this way. Response to error almost always ends up in error. And here, there was, there's been an, there was an er- error, like wrong, I wouldn't say wrong teaching. It wasn't wrong. It was unbalanced teaching, where God's the ruler. He may smite you. <laughs> he might smoke you. And, and there was this, almost this fear. This, there was uh, churches and, and preachers began to sort of, I don't know, incite fear into their people. So hopefully that would keep them in line. Right? Instead of like trusting the Holy Spirit, it's like, well, let's just use fear. And it's like, God's, a ru- God's the ruler. Now, that's true, right? Uh, um, and so I think that knee-jerk reaction after not only decades and centuries, but millennia of sort of that 
fear-based teaching, you know, that God's the ruler and he, he might smite you. It, it seems like, just to me, in my opinion, and you might disagree, that Kind of in our Christian teaching today, in a lot of churches, we focus a lot on God as provider, which is He is, and that's awesome, and we need to know that, and we preach that a lot, right? We do. But it feels like maybe we're getting out of balance a little bit again because we're not really paying a lot of attention attention to God as ruler, right? It's like, okay, God provider, got it. And if we said is God the ruler? Yes, of course we would say that. That's a Sunday school answer. But I, I just feel like the Lord really highlighted that to me actually last week. Just as a reminder, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm not just the provider. I'm, I'm the ruler. And, and, and that's one of the reasons, that's one of the things God was laying down in the Garden of Eden. In, in his love and grace and mercy and all he provided is like, just want you to know I'm the ruler, and here's a rule. Don't eat from the tree. Now, again, there's other reasons, you know, like self, uh, uh, free will and all that. I understand that, but we'll, we'll talk about that another day. A lot of Christians are quick to receive God's provision, but not so much as rulership. <laughs> um, we, as human beings, like to call the shots, we almost nobody will admit that. Some will, um, but really, it's true. It's our. It's in our human nature. Our, well, maybe even pre-fall in human nature. It's in our human nature to want to call the shots. And and so here's a weird thing. And I actually put this down as a point because it's just it's ironic. Sadly, ironic. This is number two. Our human nature is to want rules but also to resist rulership. All right, so let me show you that from the Bible. I mean, I know that's just true just looking at people and, and in my own life. I know that's true. Like, just tell me what you want me to do, like even in a marriage, right? Your spouse, just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. <laughs> well, you may or you may not, right, until your spouse says, well, here's what I want you to do. Oh, I don't want to do that, right? <laughs> like, but we want, we want the recipe, we want the checklist, we want that, but then as soon as, as, soon as we get that, it's like, well, I'll do that and that, that, but I, I don't want to do that. So we start picking and choosing. And it's kind of, it's, isn't it kind of ironic that that's our human nature? And if, if you remember the story, I'm not going to read it, but uh, when, when God was using Moses to deliver the people out of bondage, out of slavery in Egypt, taking them into the promised land, and they're wandering through the desert... And, and this is the early part of their trip. They get to Mount Sinai, and, and God is, phys- well, he's present on the mountain. His manifest present, presence is on the mountain. There's thunder and lightning, and, and God says, tells Moses, I want to be with my people. Bring my people to meet with me. Bring them to the mountain. And so Moses says, hey, we're going to the mountain. God wants to, to hang out with you guys. And like, okay. And he says, consecrate yourself because in three days we're heading there. Okay. So it comes time to do it, <laughs> to go in the presence of God. You know, there's thunder and lightning and they get scared. They get fearful. And, and, they, if, and they said, um, Moses, you go. Just find out what he wants us to do. Like, go get the rules and we'll do them. That's, that's pretty much what they said. Just tell us what to do and we'll do it. Like, <laughs> they just wanted the rules, right? Except when they got the rules, um, they didn't follow them. Right? It, didn't take, it didn't take long for them to, like, not follow those rules, right? So they were, I, I guess a nice way of saying it, they were resisting God's rulership. Actually, they were rejecting God's rulership. Um, it's the same way today. Like, just tell me what's, what my expectations are. Just tell me what you expect of me. Just tell me what the rules are. And then we get them like, oh, well, not that. And as we talk about coming under God's rulership, it's easy to understand, I think, how, like, non-believers could, like, resist that. Well, I ain't doing that. 
and it's easy even, I guess, to a point to understand why, like, I guess what you'd call marginal Christians, right? Why, how marginal Christians would kind of resist that. But what about, what about Christians that seem pretty mature? What about Christians who've had significant encounters with God? And they resist his rulership. And you're like, does that really happen? Uh, yeah. It happens a lot. <laughs> and it, it, it happened throughout history. Can I, I want to share a few biblical accounts with you. All right? Just to, to show you, because I think, I think we get complacent. Well, I don't think it. I know it. Because I know myself. Sometimes when we have these significant encounters with God, and they're awesome, and we're like, God, you're awesome, and I'm following you. At, at some point, we can get kind of complacent with that. And then we start kind of drifting. Let me just give you a few biblical examples, right? Because I'm not talking about you, of course. We're talking about somebody else, right? So um, let me give you just a few biblical accounts. Well, obviously, the first one <laughs> is Adam and Eve. I mean, think about it. After being in the physical presence of God, I mean, like walking with him in the garden, not like God somewhere out there, but like God right there talking and hanging out and being with him. I mean, how much, how much more significant, like relationally, can you get than that? And, and he's provided everything, everything they could possibly need or want. He's provided that for him. And he's established himself as ruler. Just have one rule. Don't eat that, that fruit. So when it comes to eat the fruit, it's like, well, I know here's that, that's that rule, but we're following all the other rules. Like, actually, there were no other rules, right? Like, so we just, we just want to eat that. So right from the very beginning, and man hadn't even fallen, I mean, that was the fall, really was the fall, was I want to rule my own life. I have seen, <laughs> I, I know I've done this myself, but I've seen this so much. As a pastor, we do a lot of pastoral counseling, and, and through the years, I've seen people come to seek pastoral counseling, biblical counseling. They're, they're hurt and they're broken. Life's a mess, and we pray and counsel, and they, they turn to God, and, and, and God turns things around for them, you know, maybe not right away, sometimes pretty quickly, sometimes over time, but I've seen so many people have just amazing turnarounds in their lives. And then after it gets all turned around and things are good, it's like they said, I think they're just kind of like, they wouldn't say they're turning their back on God, but it's kind of like, hey, God, thank you for creation. Thank you for fixing things. I got it from here. I got it. Thanks. I can go do it now. <laughs> and and I, I, that's, that's been happening, I think, well, since mankind, really. So Adam and Eve... Um, I guess, to put it bluntly, rejected God's rule. He established a rule, one, and they decided they wanted to make their own rules. Mentioned earlier the Israelites on Mount Sinai, you know, they, they're like, just tell us what to do and we'll do it. <laughs> so they told them what to do and then they don't do it because they want to make up their own rules. Um, King Saul, if you know that story, it's, uh, um, oh, it starts out in 1 Samuel, but Saul was, he was a big guy. He was like the first king of Israel. After they got in the promised land, Israel was uh, ruled by judges for about 400 years. But they said, we want a king. And God says, I, I'm your king. Like, no, we want a king like all the other nations have a king. So we can be cool like them. He goes, all right, you don't know what you're asking for, but... And so here's this big, strapping, tall guy, Saul. And Saul was humble and godly, and he was a warrior. And, and so there's your king. And they're like, yay! And Saul's like humble. And he, he becomes king, and he's, as he's humbly serving God... And, and following the directions from God as given by the prophet Samuel, they're, they're winning battles and they're taking big pieces of the promised land and, and really establishing peace in Israel. 
And I don't know what happened, if it was arrogance or pride. I, I think that may be a little fear of man. What will man think? But in 1 Samuel 15, it uh, tells a story of um, God, through the prophet Samuel, told Saul, the Amalekites are horrible, and they were. I'm not going to get into the whole story, about, but God said, go wipe them all out. Women, children, men, animals, don't spare anything. Nothing left. And you're like, well, that's not, some, that's not like a loving God. That's a sermon for another day. He's a very loving God for doing that. And I'll, someday I'll preach that. I have in the past, I'll preach it again. But not today, we don't have time. But that was what he said. It was a command, right? Rule, command, whatever you want to call it. He commanded Saul, go wipe them out. Don't leave anything. So Saul takes his army, who's been very successful, and he's starting maybe to get a little prideful now because he's had lots of success on the battlefield. People love him as king. Things seem pretty relatively peaceful in Israel. And, and he goes and they, they rout the Amalekites. But he's like, well, we, that would be a shame to kill the nice sheep and the nice cattle. I mean, I know God said kill them all, but let's just kill like the weak and sick ones. And you know it would be really cool if we brought King Agag back in chains. Like, humiliate him. Boy, the Amalekites would never bother us again. And no other nation is, is, would ever even think to cross us. So they're coming back from the battle. And Saul calls out to, to Samuel. He says, hey, uh, we're back and I did what God said. And Samuel said, so why, if you did, why do I hear sheep bleeding? Bah, bah. Like you were supposed to get rid of everything. And I hear sheep and cattle. And who's that guy you're leading? That looks like King Agag. Well, we, we, we only killed the weak and sick stuff. And we brought back the good stuff to sacrifice for God. That's it. To sacrifice to God. Yeah, that's why we did that. And, Saul, and Samuel's like, that's not what God said. And if you read this story, it was like, that day, God basically said, I'm done with Saul. I mean, not done, well, he's done being king. He was king for a long time after that, but it all went downhill. From that time on, when Saul became his own ruler, when he resisted the rule and reign of God in his life, his life and the whole nation of Israel went into decline, ended up with Saul's own suicide and a nation not at peace because he wanted to make his own rules. He knew what God wanted, and he's like, well, I, I got a better idea. And, and here's a, a huge point that comes out of this, and this is, oh, man, the church needs this today, and here it is. We've always needed it. Point three, service without surrender is empty religion. There are so many people who like doing their own thing in the name of serving God. <laughs> like, I just, I just got a brand new vehicle so I can serve God better. <laughs> I just got a vehicle. It's not new, but it's pretty new. It's way nicer than I deserve. Um, but it's a blessing. But it's easy to start taking things like that. Well, God, I need to get it because God, is, I'm going to use it in service to him. Now, if he wants me to have it, that's fine. I'm not breaking rules. But you understand what I'm saying? We start taking our own desires and putting sort of a religious spin on it so somehow God has to bless it, and it looks good to everybody else, but we're really making up that own, our own thing. Don't raise your hand, but anybody ever done that? <laughs> I mean, it's so easy to do, but it, when we're so blind to it because it seems like so good. You know, like when, when people go against God's rulership in an evil way, and in in it's, in it's patently evil, and we see that, like, oh, that's evil. Glad I'm not like that. But what about when it looks good, right? But still not what God wants. 
So, um, oh man, here's a great example of that. Solomon. So King Saul was the first king, then and David came as king. Um, David has had an issue, at least, we know, with God's rulership in his life when he decided, uh, you know what, I'd sure like to have sex with Bathsheba. Bring her on up. <laughs> I'm pretty sure God, you know, had like a rule against that. Like, you don't do that. But David did. Anyway, so. It's some pretty amazing people that at times when you get compl- getting complacent. It's not my nose. I'm going to veer off a little bit here. In, oh, 2 Samuel somewhere. <laughs> it says, um, in the springtime when kings go to war... King David was on the roof and noticed a woman bathing. So it's like, okay, what should he have been doing? Going to war. It's springtime. They're, they're expanding the kingdom. That's what you do. And they were having great success. But he, I don't know if he was complacent or maybe he felt entitled. Sense of entitlement. That's not a new thing. Okay, I've done plenty of battles. I'm getting older. I, don't, I think I'm just going to st- stay home, kick back. I'm, gonna, I, I'm entitled to that. I've been working hard. And in that, w- when he's not doing what he should be doing as king, in that complacency or that uh, probably a sense of entitlement, that's where he got into trouble. So anyway, so King Saul, King David, King Solomon. Solomon actually was the son born out of that affair between David and Bathsheba. Solomon, David taught him to follow God so closely and love God, and he did. Solomon started so well and finished so poorly. I know this sounds like like bummer stuff, and it is, and I'm telling you about this bummer stuff so you can see through the lens of history so we don't repeat it. All right? We'll, we'll, We'll end in a good positive note here. So... King Solomon, he, he builds the temple, uh, when, and when he dedicated it, the power of God, the glory of God came so powerfully, the priest couldn't even stand up. God appeared to um, Solomon two times, at least, that we know of, gave him a gift of wisdom, a hearing ear. I mean, he did just like, ama- it's such a, Solomon had such amazing encounters with God. And he was so close to God. And the nation was at peace and prospering. <laughs> First Kings 3.3 3. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on high places. Okay, the high places were like literally geographically high places where idol worship would take place. People would go up there with their idols. You know, they're closer to heaven or whatever. And it was a place of idol worship. But Solomon, like, like God's his God, so instead of worshiping in the temple, that's the prescribed place, right? We worship at the temple in that, un, under that covenant, right? Now the temple is in use, so we worship everywhere. Right? But at that time, you offer your service of worship in the temple, And Solomon, like, he gets a better idea. How about we go worship God on these high places, and we'll do what God wants us to do. We'll do the same thing we do in the temple. We'll burn incense, and we'll pray, and we'll do things, and and we'll be cool with the idle people, like the pagans in the land. They'll think we're cool, right? So let's let's do that. (laughs) And God says, no. No, don't do that. The more self-will that comes into worship, the less it's worship. Like, again, it's that sort of empty religion that comes without surrender. If Solomon had been totally surrendered to God, he would not be worshiping God on the high places. But he was justifying it by, it's, I'm, I'm worshiping God. It'd be like us going into, a, I don't know, a, a Satanist temple. 
and worshiping God, but we want to be kind of cool with the Satanists and kind of make peace with them, kind of show them that we're not weird, um, but to justify it. But we're, we're, we'll worship God there. Well, well, before long, it just gets all muddled. And, and <clears throat> I don't know if it's, I guess, unfortunately, fortunately, I don't know, maybe none of, those, none of the above, pagan women seem to be really beautiful. They're so pretty. And, and Solomon would begin to marry them. And he began to marry uh, women from royalty from other countries. Well, let me just read. First Kings, go to chapter 11. First Kings uh, 11, verse 1. Read the first five, or five verses there. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Did God make a rule? Yes. What was the rule? Don't marry women from those countries. Why? Because they will turn your heart from me. He, he didn't pay attention to that rule. I have a better rule. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. <laughs> Do you think? As, <laughs> sorry. As Solomon grew, not sorry. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed uh, Ashtoreth, the goddess of um, the Sidonians and Molech. Mm. Side note, all right? Um, I'm not saying that right. Ashtoreth? Um, basically a sex religion. <laughs> um, and Molech um, was a god they sacrificed live babies to. Mm. Okay, just problem in our nation today. We have a problem with just sex that is out of, way out of biblical bounds, way out, and we still are sacrificing live babies. All right, that's all I need to say about that. So that's what happens when you don't, when you don't have the rulership of Jesus Christ in your life. When you like, well, let's just make peace with people. Let's just let them know we're cool. We'll worship God, but we'll, we'll, it's, we'll do it our way, not his way. Our way works better. Anyway, Solomon was marrying these foreign women to, to form alliances with these countries so they could have peace. The weird thing is they already had peace. They had peace. When Solomon was fully engaged, fully surrendered to God, they had prosperity and peace. When he began to turn away from that slowly by slowly, as Pastor Joseph would say, slowly by slowly, um, there was not peace. There was decline. And, and the country, it never actually ever really recovered from that. They had some better times, but like 300 years later... 1 Kings 11.9... The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. <laughs> it's like, I have physically shown up to this guy two times. Like we had this wonderful relationship. And I'm providing everything for him. Their nation has peace and prosperity. He's like the richest man in the universe, you know, like next to God, right? And he's turned away from me. It's, he wasn't fully surrendered. And if you would ask Solomon, is Yahweh your God? <laughs> well, duh, yeah, of course he is. I, I make sacrifices to him in the high places, with, which is cool, right? Yeah, he's my God. Of course he's my God. How dare you ask? Just asking. Here, I guess then this is point number four. Surrender to God's rulership in our life is an ongoing process. Like, 
these people we talked about, like well, Adam and Eve, I guess, really starting there, but um, um, Saul and David and Solomon, that so they were so surrendered to the reign and rule of, of, of God, the, the reign and rule of God in their life. They're so surrendered to that that there's peace and there's prosperity. And I'm not saying every day is easy for them, but they were in a good spot. But, and God, like, is appearing to them. I mean, they have this connection that's supernatural. It's not just a philosophy. I mean, they have this relationship. And then for whatever reason, if it's entitlement or complacency, I, all the above... Pretty soon, you know, they make one little rule, exception, their own rule. Like, hey, thanks for all the cool stuff, God. You know, I'd like to do this, and I'm entitled to that. Or I'd like to do that, because it's not going to hurt anybody. Everybody else is doing it. Blah, 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 blah. As soon as we st stop surrendering to Jesus, our life starts to decline. And I think if you've been... With this body long enough, I, I hope you know that I'm not a legalist. I'm not legalistic. We are set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. But there, we're still called to holiness. We're, we're called to biblical values and biblical views. We're called to that. And we're to walk in that. And we're, and we're not to sin and a lot of Christians do a pretty good job at that, but then there's these areas like, well, this is one, this is one thing I'm going to do. And sometimes we know it's not right. Sometimes we actually think it's better than God's idea. Oh, let's bring back some of the good sheep. Let's not kill them. God would like that better. He's going to like my idea better than his own idea. <laughs> oh, man. I'm preaching to myself. I tell you all the time, you're eating what I'm eating, all right? Pastor doesn't feed us. Well, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, you're eating what I'm eating, so if I'm not feeding you, I'm sorry. I don't know. I'll try to do something else wrong so I can preach on it. It's a joke. Thanks for laughing. At least I hope it's a joke. Number five, Christ's rulership in our, in our life is to make us more like him. God as our ruler is not to be like this oppressive demander. I was talking with Rose Cooley, I don't know, Friday I guess it was, kind of about these concepts and about, you know, God has commands. And she says, and she, she'd heard this somewhere else, but when we hear the word command, we think demand. Like God demands this and God demands that. Well, demanding and commanding are kind of two different things. But he does, he does have commands, right? Um, but we take it like, like there's all this we kind, of, we kind of bristle. God's so demanding. Like, he's doing it to make you more like him. He, he, his commands, his rules, as we call it, are to make you more like him. Because he experiences perfect peace and joy. And he gives and receives love. Infinitely. I mean, so many of those amazing things that are wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ, he wants for you. And the Bible says we're to be transformed from glory to glory, like the reflection of Jesus. We're supposed to look more and more like Jesus as we travel this Christian life. And part of that, I'm not saying it's the biggest part, but part of that is, and it is a big part, we need to be surrendered to the rule and reign of Jesus in our life. And when, we're, when we do that, our path to Christ-likeness is much straighter and easier. So I had one of these um, moments. I've, I've shared some, sometimes when I'm um, studying, either for a sermon or just on my own, and I find like a gem of, of original Hebrew word or the gem of original Greek word in the Bible. Old Testament is written in Hebrew, New Testament in Greek. Well, I found one of those um, this week, and I was so tickled. That's why I had to go tell Rose. Rose, I just found, I just found a, a gem. I got to share it with you. And that's when we started talking about this. Because um, I was thinking, all right, I, I, I know this verse well, John 14, 21. 
just the first part of it. It says, whoever has, this is Jesus speaking, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Part of showing our love to Jesus is to be surrendered to his rule and reign. When we surrender to his rule and reign, it shows that we love him. Okay, that's fair, right? Again, it's not an oppressive, demanding rulership. It's a loving rulership to help us make, him more, make us more like him. So, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And so I did a word search, a word study on the word commands. Those who, uh, whoever has my commands. Um, the Greek word is uh, entole, and it means, here's, and this is so good, authoritative prescription. Like, oh, that is so good. I actually called it in your bulletin. That's what I put the sermon of the title of the, title of the sermon. Um, authoritative prescription. Like, like, if you're not well and you go to the doctor, he might write you a prescription. He might prescribe some course of action to you, maybe a medication or something. He's going to prescribe something. All right? That's what where, that's where this, this word command comes from. But it's not just prescribe. It's authoritative prescription. So somebody in authority is prescribing this. And why do you take a prescription? To get better. Right? Hopefully. And, and so he's prescribing something to help you get better. I don't, and please hear, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying this is about striving or actions. or I'm talk, When I say better, I'm talking more like Christ. All right? Which is better. Isn't that better? Right? Isn't the more and more you get like Jesus, the better and better you're, you are? Yes. Okay, so again, don't, don't read a legalistic thing in there because that's not that. Jesus wants you more like him. And he has prescriptions to help you get there. Kind of guidelines. So you're not off in the weeds getting all hung up and bogged down like a lot of people do. Like Saul did. Like Solomon did. People at Mount Sinai did. Christians through all our age, through all the ages, somehow get bogged down. If you, and I just know that if you go back, what is the common denominator? Denominator, it's not being surrendered to the rule and reign of God. As simple as that. In in, in maybe just certain areas, because we think, well, if I'm surrendered to God, it's like I'm surrendered. It's like no, there are areas we don't surrender. There are huge areas we do surrender, and then areas we don't. Mine. <laughs> this, is my, this is my personal little thing. I think David called them cherished sins. I cherish this one. I, like, I know, I, I, just, I just want this for me. Or I got a better idea than you, God. Oh. Oh, authoritative prescription. I, I, I hope that whenever you read the word command in the Bible from God, that you'll think of that, those two words, authoritative prescription. It's like, oh, God is prescribing something that will help me. And he's prescribing it from a place of authority. So he knows what he's doing. I can trust that, and I'm going to do it because I know it's going to help me. I don't know about you, but that helps me like be cool with those words like, Jesus commanding stuff, right? Not that I wasn't cool, but you know, sometimes we, our legalistic mind takes us to a place where it's like, oh, God doesn't want us to have any fun. Right? He has so many rules. Like, I don't know if I'll do this in two weeks. Um, I might, I'm thinking about, I might preach on, okay, what, what are his rules? Because <laughs> it's like one verse, so I can, tell, I can preach that, right? So we'll see. I can't promise. It depends on what he wants to do. It might be my own thought. I might be making my own rule. I don't know. I've got to find out if it's his. I've got to surrender a little bit this next week and see. So, when Jesus came, and we teach this a lot here, he came preaching the kingdom of heaven. He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the kingdom of God. Use that interchangeably. He used it interchangeably. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Um, this isn't heaven. 
right? There's a, a future fulfillment of heaven where everything's perfect, no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, all that. That's awesome. That's great. We're looking forward to that. We're not here, but yet the kingdom of heaven is here. And here it is, and this is number six. The kingdom of heaven is the rule and reign of Jesus in your life. All right, so like Jesus said, you don't look around like, oh, there's the kingdom over there, or there's the kingdom over there. It's like, no, it's in you. And when, when people who, who um, are surrendered to the rule and reign of Jesus Christ and, and made him their king, they're in the kingdom, and there is a kingdom. So there is a kingdom all over the world, the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, made up of believers who made Jesus their king. Kings make rules. Kings rule and reign. And the rule and reign of the King Jesus in your heart is what expands the kingdom on earth. 600 years before the new covenant, prophet Jeremiah God was speaking through Jeremiah, and he wrote this. He's, he's, he's telling what the new covenant is going to entail. All right? so they're still in the old covenant. They've been a thousand years in the old covenant. And, and the new covenant wouldn't happen for another 600 years. But God is really clearly outlining the new covenant, which we're now under. And here's just one verse, Jeremiah 31, verse 33. This is God speaking. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. And we're grafted into that, so that includes us, all right? So that includes you. This covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it, in their, write it on their hearts. I'll be their God, and they will be my people. When Jesus writes his prescription for you, he's writing it on your heart. Like, if you, like where's that prescription? Did I? Oh. It's in me. And, and that word mind, when he uh, I would put it in their minds, <laughs> it actually, the word, uh, the um, Hebrew word for mind in that sense actually means, well, they say it a nice word. They say entails. I say guts. It's like it's, it's in your guts. It's like in the innermost being, in the heart heart there is innermost being. So there's two words that mean a lot of the same thing, mind and heart. It's like that innermost being. It's like the core of who we are. Our, like that, mm, not just our brain thinking. And so God says, I, that's where I'm going to put my rules. It's in their hearts, in their innermost being. So I don't have to rush around looking at tablets of stone you know, written rules, check, did that, check, did that, check, did that, because it's out of relationship. It's all about the Holy Spirit uh, convicting us and leading us and guiding us and, and helping us surrender to the rule and reign of God so that we can be more like Jesus Christ. Jesus is writing his prescription on your heart. He wants to do that today because he wants you to get better. Better in the sense, more like him. And I'm, I'm for that. Like, I want that. And, and I want to stay surrendered. And I hope that's in your heart today, too. Why don't you stand as we close this morning, if you're physically able. And uh, we'll have a prayer time. People come back up as we close. You might want to um, pray for any need you might have today. They're, they're here to do that. But today would be a really good day to just solidify the rule and reign of Jesus in your heart. If you've never done that, if you've never acknowledged Jesus as king, come up and let these people up front help you do that. <laughs> put your faith and trust in Jesus. But for those of you here that have put your faith and trust in Jesus, which is almost all, if not all, probably, um, I know there are times when we have walked unsurrendered in certain areas of our life. David, who God himself called a man after my own heart, did that. He said, and, and the Bible says, God loved David, like, except for that one thing. <laughs> not that he didn't love him. I mean, not that he didn't love him. It's just like that, that one thing with Bathsheba, not a good thing. But otherwise, David, man, guy after my heart. So, 
so don't feel, if, if you're feeling guilt and shame and condemnation, that's not from the Lord, that's from the enemy. And we rebuke that in Jesus' name. However, when the Holy Spirit convicts, it draws you closer to God. And that's, what, that's my prayer for you today is if there's areas in, in your life, areas in my life, our lives, that are not surrendered to the rule and reign of Jesus Christ, that we would surrender that. That we would follow that prescription that he's writing on our hearts by the Holy Spirit so that we can become more like him. Let's make that our prayer. Lord, we do want to be more like you. Because when we're like you, there is peace. There's love, there's patience, there's gentleness, there's all those, the fruit of the Spirit, all is there. And, it, and with your rule and reign in our hearts, as kingdom people, people of your kingdom, your kingdom is, is advanced in the way you want it to advance. People see that and they want to be a part of that. We want that, Lord. Our world needs it. Our world needs your kingdom to advance. And for that, Lord, you need to be king of kings and lord of lords and not us making the rules. So today, Lord, we surrender every bit of our lives to you, our hearts, our minds, our innermost being, that you would write your laws on our hearts. We would follow you and do what you want with joy and thanksgiving, knowing that it leads to peace and prosperity and closeness with you. Thank you for that. We proclaim it now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.